Presidential Election Series invites a broad range of highly accomplished men and women from the professional, academic, artistic, and political worlds to dialogue with the Mega Everest College community on issues of historical and contemporary importance. By providing a forum for the free exchange of ideas and issues, the college continues in its mission of promoting intellectual curiosity, political engagement, and social commitment. Originally conceived as part of the freshman year program, the Presidential Lecture Series has now become a college-wide program, welcoming students from every academic discipline. The, <clears throat> the stated purpose of the series is to expose the entire student population to an array of individuals who experience commitment and multicultural perspectives will serve as an inspiration to the college community. Again, I just want to uh, welcome everyone here and sit back, relax, open your ears, open your minds, and enjoy the show. Charlotte Phoenix. I am the Senior Vice President and Provost of Medgar Evers College, and I'd like to start by thanking our uh, music professor, Roman Mitchell, and the outstanding, talented students who perform. This month, we have a very exciting presentation that's coming from another one of our esteemed faculty members, 
uh, the professor and deputy chair of the English department, Linda Susan Jackson. And I'm going to defer to Dr. Kimming Liu to actually formally introduce her. So at this time, I'd like to introduce Professor Kimming Liu, who will introduce our esteemed speaker, Linda Susan Jackson. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dr. Kimming Liu, professor of English at Megara Evers College. It is a distinct honor to introduce to you my colleague, friend, and fellow YG, AKA Yellow Girl, Linda Susan Jackson, our beloved poet in residence, whose brilliant book, What Yellow Sounds Like, if you don't have a copy, go rush to the bookstore. Which one? Linda will introduce to you the bookstore and get one, which Burst it on the literary scene like a blast of, did we have brass? We didn't, in an orchestral overture. There's something universal about the potency of color. For example, it has always been a powerful symbol in Chinese literature, politics, and even cuisine, if you have ever dined in a posh Chinese restaurant you see the presentation of the food. With the fast approaching opening of the Olympics in Beijing this summer, which is going to be on August 8th, 8, 8, 2008. It'll be a test later on why falling on the three eight or eights. The Chinese government in welcoming this event recently unveiled a brand new terminal at the Beijing International Airport that was designed to evoke the mythological dragon, a symbol of China. But upon entering the terminal, you're greeted with the vermilion color, that bright glowing red that brings good luck. At departure, however, you're sent away, surrounded by gold or yellow, suggesting good fortune. Linda Jackson delves her identity in the color chart of world meanings. She deploys here a rich yet accessible language that evokes a profound yearning for creativity. Like Alice Walker, many of you have read her piece, Linda is in search of her ancestral garden where she discovers her own voice. Please join me in welcoming our beloved poet, Linda Susan Jackson. <laughs> Good afternoon, Medgar Evers College. Good afternoon. Students, faculty, colleagues, staff, and friends. When I was asked to deliver the presidential lecture, I was both excited and humbled by the prospect of this opportunity. I first want to thank President Edison O. Jackson for giving me this honor and it is indeed an honor for me, an honor I don't take lightly. I also want to thank his staff, VP Davis and Jimmy Jenkins for helping me prepare for today. And I'd like to thank Dr. Kaming Liu for that introduction as she has been like a sister to me since I joined the English department. For the past few weeks, I was thinking about what I would say to you today that would be both useful and memorable, informative and inspiring. And since I know my writing process, I knew I could not rush things. I was thinking about the fact that already in your life, you've heard so much. People talking to you, telling you what to think, what to feel, what you ought to do with your life. And I didn't want to be another talking head ending up in your memory as so much noise, or as the late great godfather of soul, James Brown said, talking loud and saying nothing. 
And in the interest of full public disclosure, in these times when every public utterance is microscopically scrutinized, I'd like to give full attribution to James Brown for that expression, as he is the first one I heard say it. And in this way, none of the scud missile journalists can accuse me of plagiarism. So last Sunday, while I was reading a magazine, I came across an article that referenced the Greek myth of Narcissus and Echo. Now bear with me a little bit while I tell you a little bit about this myth. And once you hear it, I think you'll understand its relevance in our conversation today. Narcissus was the son of one of the water goddesses who ruled the rivers and springs. And one day, Narcissus sees his image in the water and instantly falls in love with it. Out of that myth comes a word I know you've heard before, narcissism, which is a total and complete obsession with the self. As it happens, another water nymph whose name is Echo falls in love with Narcissus. And Echo, like the other water nymphs, they're known as naiads, are curse prone. And her curse was that she could not hear her own voice. She could only voice the thoughts, ideas, and words of others. When Narcissus dies, now there is a version of the myth that says he commits suicide, but that's a story for another time or a story for which you can do your own research. What is relevant here is that when Narcissus dies, Echo is so devastated by his death that she wanders off to haunt the canyons and glens, repeating only the random words shouted out by strangers. Hence, the meaning of the word echo. We never get to hear her voice first, as she only repeats what she's heard. And this is a reflection that leads me to the questions that frame my conversation with you today. Do you listen for your own voice? Do you hear it? Or are you another echo, repeating only what you hear others say, what you hear them tell you to say? Of course, there are so many questions that crop up, and this is something I've learned as I've matured. When I was young, I thought arrogantly that I had all the answers. But at this point in my life, I have more questions than answers. I also realize that I learn most and best through literature, because it is literature that shows me, that teaches me without hurling me up against a wall. Literature opens a door to the experiences complexities and behaviors of others as they act out answers to the questions they have or may not even know they have about what it takes to be human in this world. So the questions I want to pose to you today that I want you to ponder, and these are by no means all the questions you will need in life, but they are a start. One, who am I? Two, who do you want to be? Three, where am I now? Four, where do I want to go? Five, how do I get there? Six, am I echo, doomed to wait for someone else's voice before I can speak? Doomed to have the last word, but no power to speak the first? These are some of the questions you will need to continually ask yourself. And the answers you have today will not serve you 10 years from now, five years from now, or even tomorrow. As uh, Kiming said, I am a poet, but I'm really a storyteller masquerading as a poet. I tell stories in my poems not because that is what I plan to do, but because that is the tradition out of which I come. I learned the importance and relevance of storytelling, of myth-making from within my own family. 
When I was quite young, around the age of three, my brother and I would lie on the floor at the top of the stairs in my grandmother's house and listen to the big stories the adults told when they thought we were out of range. And believe me, we heard many stories lying on that floor. One of the stories that stood out for me was the story about my great grandmother. They said she walked all the way from Virginia to New York, a distance of about 600 miles, a distance today that would take eight or nine hours by car on the paved Interstate 95. Who knows how long it would take to walk 600 miles. You could well imagine how amazing this story was for me to hear as a child. And since I overheard it, I couldn't ask anyone the veracity of that story. It's something I heard and something I really wanted to believe was true. Just think for a moment what it must have taken for a black woman <clears throat> to leave her family and friends and come all the way to New York in 1910, just 40 years or so after the end of slavery, 40 years or so after emancipation. Now, I don't really know how much of that story is true, how much is exaggerated, but what I do know is that there is real power in this story and what the story teaches. Whenever I am faced with something that seems insurmountable or beyond my reach, I think about my great-grandmother walking to New York to make a way for herself that was different from what she knew was available for the women in her town at that time. <clears throat> Let's remember, it was 1910, a time when women still didn't have the right to vote. In fact, women had no le real legal identity beyond one that they earned as someone else's wife or someone's daughter. 1910 was a time when not, not much beyond being a servant or a domestic was possible or probable for women. Whenever I get discouraged, if things don't turn out exactly as I plan, I think about my great-grandmother walking to New York, a place she had never been, but a place of which she had obviously heard. Her walking here with nothing but the clothes on her back and those she carried in a tattered suitcase. Walking here to New York, 600 miles, with nothing but her faith in her God and in herself and her own singular voice urging her on. There were no hotels, no inns, no rest stop as soon as you cross the Delaware Memorial Bridge. In fact, there was no Delaware Memorial Bridge, not in 1910. And I get goosebumps and fill up when I think about that now. And it is her voice I hear when I need to be urged on, when I need to have a perspective about what is truly hard or difficult, when I need to be reminded that some of the rights I take so much for granted today were unimaginable, if not illegal, for her in 1910. That is the power of storytelling, of myth-making. Myths provide a way to reveal life, to teach invaluable lessons of survival, to show the complexities of people in the context of living a life without the hot eyes of judgment. Some people think of myths as untrue, but I believe there is truth or truism in the heart of every myth. I had the good fortune to know my great-grandmother. In fact, she passed when I was 32, so I knew her for a long time. But I never asked her about the story of her walking to New York because the facts no longer mattered. The facts could not serve me. 
They could not tell me what I needed to know about her. The voice in the myth had far deeper value. It gave me the power to help me make my own voice. Unlike poor little Echo, who never found her own voice, today I ask you, are you an empty cistern waiting for someone to drop in a pebble so you can echo its impact as voice? Can you hear your voice over the din of distractions, the cacophony of colloquialisms that rise to muffle out your voice? And there is a lot of noise on the road today, horns honking, blackberries ringing, the street corner beckoning, the backbeat of a song reverberating, iPod speakers glued to your ear, your voice a whisper, or is it an echo? Let's not forget little Echo, who was always waiting for someone else's voice, but you can't wait, because time doesn't wait. I remember when I graduated from high school, I was young, not quite 16. I went right into college, not because it was what I wanted, but because it was the thing to do right after high school. And it was also what my father said I must do. But I never stopped to ask myself, is this what I really wanted for myself? So what happened? I dropped out. And of course, my father stopped speaking to me. It was hard for him to understand why I would jeopardize a full scholarship to do something he considered utterly frivolous, taking a semester off to figure out if college was really what I wanted for myself. I remind him now that I earned my, my decision-making skills from him. I tell you this story so you can understand <clears throat> that listening to your own voice can be risky because it sometimes requires you to go against the expectations of others who think they know what is best for you. Listening to your own voice can be frightening and there may be repercussions. I once heard John Coltrane say that playing with Thelonious Monk was like stepping into a room without a floor. Well, that's what it feels like when your voice leads you to defy conventional wisdom in favor of what you think is right for you. There's nothing familiar, no markers, nothing to guide you but the North Star that is your voice. Remember my 15-year-old grandmother, great-grandmother, walking on the road by herself in 1910, on the way to New York from her small country town in Virginia, listening to the strength of her inner voice. Remember also Echo, who ha whose fate it was to always have the last word, but not the power to utter the first word. Echo had to wait for someone else's voice before she could be heard, but you don't have that time to wait. In the sanctuary of learning, minds and space merge in a tranquil setting. Glass, air, light, and space for intellects to grow that blossom seeds of knowledge, unfolding in a contemplative world of books, reading, and information, sturdy, steady, and strong, creating success one student at a time. Medgar Evers College, come and learn.
once you see the world through math and science, you'll never see anything the same way again. Go to girlsgotech.org. You'll see. I have one more little story to share with you. Before I began teaching and writing, I was first an accountant, then a budget director, then an assistant commissioner, and right before I started teaching, I was a deputy commissioner for administration with the New York City Department of Transportation. It was a big job. I was the first black woman to hold such a position in that agency and I was among only two or three black female commissioners working for the city at that time. But that position <clears throat> was not what I wanted for myself. It made everybody else happy, but it did nothing to fuel my passions. Everybody else was happy, but I didn't like getting up in the morning. Eventually, I walked away from that job and it was a high paying job. I don't know what you think about that decision and I can tell you that almost everyone in my life at that time thought I had lost my mind. And believe me, they voiced their opinions loud and clear. But I was not echo. My voice said write. My voice said teach. And I couldn't ignore my voice forever, just as you can't ignore your voice. Don't be afraid, although it is frightening, sometimes to listen to your own voice. Think about how afraid my great-grandmother was in 1910, almost 100 years ago, coming to New York all by herself. It's irrelevant whether she walked or took a cab. She came here just as so many of you have come from so far away, leaving so much of what is familiar to you. But remember who you are. In one of my favorite films, Daughters of the Dust, the elder Nanny Pazant says to the younger ones, you are the children of the ones who chose to survive. For me, the most important verb, the most important word in that sentence is the verb chose. They chose to survive. In them was a voice saying, you must live. Even in the face of the atrocious, dehumanizing uncertainty of slavery, you must live. Even despite the horrors and the memory of the Middle Passage, the voice in them said, live. The voice inside you says, today, remember who you are. Remember you are not an echo waiting on someone else's action, someone else's sound to hit you in order to hear a voice. You have your own voice. You can choose to sing your own song. You can write your own script. You can write your own story. You can choose. Today, you know you are not an echo, torn up over Narcissus, who could only love himself, who only loves his own reflection. You are not an echo, waiting on someone else's sound to hear your own voice. Today, before you leave this auditorium, take a moment, sit very still, and maybe you'll hear the fire that is your voice. I'd like to, as every poet does, close out our conversation with a poem. And if you open the program, you'll walk with one of my poems, but I'm gonna read something different. I'm feeling inspired to read something different. Um, the people who know me best know how much I love music. 
60s Motown, jazz, but I particularly love singers. And Etta James, who you may or may not know, has been extremely influ influential in my life. In fact, I would consider her my muse. So I'd like to read the title poem in my collection, which is called What Yellow Sounds Like, little selfish promotion here. <clears throat> what Yellow Sounds Like. It's two parts. One, that January day back in 38, somebody picked up a rainbow and broke the sky in two, releasing James Etta Hawkins into a two-tone world that eats up yellow by the dozens, a yellow so pure it gilds the LA sun. Round-faced and blighted by a mole on the right side of her cheek, she came prepared to drench the world in love and agony, her salty smolder on record labels not yet named. By 1953, cat-eyed, eyebrows thickly arched with the black of a used match, hair enduringly blonde, she cut her first record at 15, Roll With Me Henry, making promises she couldn't possibly keep, steeping her sound so deep, its punishment feels like protection. They shorten her name, invert it like the bottom. She becomes Etta James, too big to be invisible, canary-colored blues woman, rot gut, gut bucket, bucket of blood, blood and pluck, plucked nightly on a four-by-four four stage of a juke joint, pulsing with sallow smells of sweet wine, raunchy hopes, smoky dreams bathing in mustard-colored lights, too. They tell her she has to live it, to sing it. They don't tell her Bessie and Billy had done that already. So she flings fire for the fatherless girls who are trying to be women razors piercing men with words like, cling to me, daddy. Pleading with the wrong one to trust in me. Promising she would rather go blind than lose the man she loved and Etta just kept on. As she opened her veins, she churned up her roar to keep other women from dying even temporarily, spreading their hips on bar stools, open toe, black, sling back high heel, dangling from the right foot of a crossed leg. All the while, Etta stomped, barefoot on stage, platinum hair authentically blending with the yoke yellow scream she hurled from the marrow of her voice, scorched and scared, jaundiced by the freedom of surviving a rage simmering somewhere between heaven and heat. And I don't think I could get away with <clears throat> not reading the provost's favorite poem, <clears throat> which is entitled Hair, Hair for Cynthia. The story begins as it has from the beginning. My mother is thankful that there is hair, not good, not bad, not yet. I learn what I need to know about hair sitting on the floor between 
swollen knees with long memories. Curiosity moves my head around, brush cracks scalp. I sit stone still. Your hair is nappy as a sheep's behind, she says, sucking her teeth, combing her past and her present in my hair. On days she hums Sarah Vaughan, I get two braids. With Etta James, I'm on the hardwood for hours. On alternate Fridays, Glover's mange washes through my forest of hair. Scalp stings for two days. On Sundays, I sit in a high back chair in the kitchen, head bent, chin in chest, Metal comb lies in flames. I smell last week's sacrifice, cremated at the altar of Madam C.J. Walker. Hot comb slides in slippery hands as it cleans tightly curled kitchens. My jaws clench. Saliva rises in my mouth with the smell of wet, greased protein burning. Hot comb teeth marks frame my face with a new hairline. Smoke trails up from the curling iron as it cools on a tattered towel. I hold my ear for Shirley Temple curls. What I get are bent ends that curve royal crown stiff. No bounce, no dance, no bojangle. At night, hair set in brown paper, wire, plastic, or sponge, tied up in a stained scarf. I dream of a time before my hair was straightened, nearly dead, when rain, a swim, or a sweat didn't frighten my roots. And I think I'll close with. Uh, this actually was uh, supposed to be the first title of the book, A History of Beauty. But some kind of way, Etta James stood up in a dream I was having and said, uh-uh. So I have to listen to my muse. A History of Beauty. Mother told me. I'm from a line of technicolor women with mountains of breasts and wide laps that held nursing children or steel bowls filled with June peas. With words, they were acrobats, tongues colliding with a firmness as flexible yet specific as Ma Rainey lyrics, matching memories of bent backs third grade geography books, midnight riders, unplanned births, but there is something more. Like nightingales, their sounds of love and loss echo in kitchens, bouncing off the harshness of hot plate brewed coffee and two day old biscuits sopping up caro syrup. In their songs, they remember the feeling of that first kiss as they followed their men to northern cities, men who bit their tongues, ate dirt, dust, or their pride, worked anywhere. These women knew only a blues could match the painful smell of faces stuck to the goggles their men wore in steel factories. Now, they have no time for beauty. Theirs left in the sound of wind whispering through bulrush, the teeming taste of scoopinong grapes, the anticipation of a ham dotted with a patchwork of cloves spinning on a spit, 
and hints of honeysuckle buried freely in the folds of their flesh. Um, my family, as I'm sure other families have, um, their own rituals associated with death and dying. And I've always been curious about um, my family's rituals. I attended, I remember attending the first funeral in my family when I was three. <laughs> so, and this poem actually came out of something I heard um, my mother and her sisters and my grandmother and her sisters, they called them professional mourners. And I remember as a kid trying to figure out what that meant. So this poem is my attempt to answer that question. And it's called Family Outing. Because she was homesick for the smell of Virginia tobacco and pit roasted hog, because she longed to hear her big brother scratch out blues on his box because she craved the feel of corn silk and had six stair-step children before she was 25. She went to the funerals of strangers. Twice a week, she'd dress up her five daughters and the one son, fill a paper bag full of saltines, the oldest daughter my mother carried, and out they'd go, roaming the streets in search of a small cluster of people, darkly dressed and a hearse in front of any building. They grew as professional mourners, learning funerals the way other people learn opera, Funerals are opera, grand affairs, perfumed buxom women, stalwart faced men, and reserved seating where they'd sit quietly, hands in laps, crying on cue to precious Lord or any deep orchestral chord. <laughs> What made you want to go on to this uh, journey of self-discovery? I didn't. I wasn't always a writer, but I was always a reader. Um, and all writers must read. You must read everything: fiction, nonfiction, other poets. Um, I'd done a lot of things before I actually started to put pen to paper. But I think always somewhere in my head, I was always writing. I didn't know it, but things were being written in my head, and it just turned out to be the time for me to committed to the page. Thank you. Who knows what I'll be doing in 20 years. How long have you been writing poetry? Um, well, I guess I've been writing all my life. I just didn't know it. And I actually started seriously writing about uh, 12 or 13 years ago. What is your next step? I don't have a concept in mind right now. I'm just writing one poem and the next poem, and the next poem, and the next poem. And then they start to speak to one another, and then I know I have something. OK, thank, thank you. Thank you. For aspiring poets, how can we venture into getting a book published or getting Ooh. it out there to the, the rest of the okay, world? OK, first thing you can do is take my poetry class in the fall. That's, t <laughs> That's the first thing. Because I'm a writer, I've been a writer since I was a kid, and one of the things that I'm a little intimidated by is not being respected for my style of work. Mm. And mm. it's a bit, it's a risk that you take. It is a risk. But like you said, you followed your own voice and I'm having a struggle as to what is my voice. Writing is my passion, acting is what I love, mm -hmm. but science I love as well. So there's a struggle. Well, um, I had a similar struggle because I actually was a math major when I started college. Hello, and I'm teaching English now, so go figure. Um, but you have to just stay on your road and trust your voice. Um, initially, I'm not sure that a voice emerges. I did a lot of imitative work, imitating the writers who I love, like Lucille Clifton and Rita Dove. I imitated their poems because I thought, I respected their work so much that I was writing like them. 
and I had to do, that was part of my process before my own voice can emerge, could emerge. So I would say trust in yourself and keep writing and not worry about the public acceptance because if that's what's I mean, driving I, I, you. I mean, the thing is, is that the content is not always comfortable. But if you are but deciding that for yourself, I think you're doing yourself a injustice. injustice. And there are plenty of workshops around um, for you. If you find a workshop that doesn't work for you, go to the next workshop and keep looking until you find what you need. Read other magazines, go to readings, take workshops, really important. And read the people who are writing today. Read. Every great writer must read. Must read what other people are writing, what other people are thinking. So before I became a writer, I was an avid reader. I started reading really early. I don't know, maybe four. By the time I was four, I was reading, and I read voraciously. And I think that's another thing that helps me, because you get to see patterns of writing that you then imitate. Oh, well, that's a continual battle I fight. I'm always afraid. It doesn't seem like it, but I am always afraid. Um, because some of the things that I may have to write about are frightening things, are things that I don't even want to think about. So I just go head first. So you never get over the fear? No. Okay. I mean, some people may, but I don't. You need the courage to just keep moving forward. You know, let's not forget the little story I told you about my great-grandmother. She was 15 when she came to New York, 100 years ago. No public conveyance, no 24-hour subway, no metro card. Once you see the world through math and science, you'll never see anything the same way again. Go to girlsgotech.org. You'll see. sanctuary of learning, minds and space merge in a tranquil setting, glass, air, light, and space for intellects to grow, that blossom seeds of knowledge, unfolding in a contemplative world of books, reading, and information, sturdy, steady, and strong, creating success one student at a time. Maker Evers College, come and learn. We are going to have with us today, we're honored to have Mr. Fred Chapman, who is the regional sales manager of Miller Brewing Company, and he has a special presentation he's going to make to a Medgar Evers College student and a Thurgood Marshall College Fund scholar. For those of you who may not know your history as well as you should, uh, Thurgood Marshall was the first African American to serve on the United States Supreme Court. Prior to that, he had been the chief counsel for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund and had a rather distinguished career of public service and outstanding practice of law and jurisprudence. 
The fund is named for him and it was established in 1987. It represents 47 public historically black colleges and universities. The Miller Brewing Company is a founding sponsor of the fund and Mr. Chapman is here to continue their support of the fund and indeed of Medgar Evers College. So at this time, could we have a wonderful and rousing welcome for Mr. Chapman. Hello and good afternoon. I'm Fred Chapman. I'm the regional sales manager for Miller Brewing Company here in New York City. I'm very pleased to be here today. I understand that the presidential lecture series is a very special event for Medgar Evers College. And I'm very happy that Miller Brewing Company is participating. 20 years ago, the Miller Brewing Company recognized the need to fund and support our historically black public colleges and universities and the students attending those institutions. To fill this gap, Miller became a founding corporate sponsor of the Thurgood Marshall College Fund. In fact, my good friend and colleague, Larry Waters, Miller's senior director of multi-relation, excuse me, multicultural relations, who was not able to be here today, serves as a member on the board of the Thurgood Marshall College Fund. He is very passionate about the fund and hires a Thurgood Marshall Fund uh, student to be a summer intern each year in Milwaukee. For years, Miller has forged strong partnerships and invested in focused areas that support key initiatives that help our communities reach new possibilities and progress. One of our key focus areas is education. A good education is critical for our nation's future and one that we're very, very passionate about. I am pleased to be here today at Megar Evers College where the commitment to quality to education is so evident. I'm extremely proud of the role Miller Brewing Company has played historically and will continue to play in helping the Thurgood Marshall Fund fulfill its mission through efforts such as the Dreams Delivered Scholarship. The Thurgood Marshall College Fund and Miller share a common belief and commitment towards improving the quality of life within our communities while enhancing the educational and economic opportunities for all Americans. I am honored to be here today to represent Miller Brewing Company and the Dreams Delivered Scholarship to a deserving young lady who is an example of the caliber of the student that we have envisioned since the onset of our partnership with the Thurgood Marshall College Fund. I am very, very pleased to present the Miller Brewing Company Dreams Delivered Scholarship in the amount of $4,400 to a very deserving sophomore and business major, Elizabeth Freeman Poyser. <laughs> After 20 years, Miller Brewing Company still remains committed to the Thurgood Marshall College Fund as a major corporate sponsor. We look forward to continuing our dream and our partnership. We thank you and we hope you have a great afternoon. Wow. Good afternoon, everybody. I just would like to say that this is such an awesome, 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 awesome thing. And I know a lot of times we see people get these opportunities and they walk up there and you're like, wow, they must have it all together. But you know what? You just try to keep it together. And you have to try to keep it together no matter what happens. Because I had no idea. I promise you. And that's just how things come in life. They will not always let you know they're coming, but they will be there. So keep your faith, because it works. It really works. I had no idea. But I look forward, I just want to say I look forward to seeing a lot of you students, because I also work with the Academic Foundation. We're helping a lot of incoming freshmen. I also work with the Freshman Year Program, helping students when you come into college for the first time. A lot of times you may be afraid and not know what's going on. I w I'm one of those students who help you. I have some students that's in the audience, and they can vouch that I am dedicated. So I'm going to do this, but I just want you to know that you can do it too. This is all right, OK? On behalf of the president and of, and of Medgar Evers College as a whole, we'd like to thank Miller 
Brewing Company for its continued support of the Thurgood Marshall Fund and also of the uh, students here at Medgar Evers. So thank you for joining our partnership for creating success one student at a time. of Medgar Evers College as a whole. We'd like to thank Miller Brewing Company for its continued support of the Thurgood Marshall Fund and also of the uh, students here at Medgar Evers. So thank you for joining our partnership for creating success one student at a time.